You know, God, God blessed us, and we, didn't even, we had no clue that it would ever turn into what it's turned into. But uh, when I started hearing from people around the country and, and even around the world that they were watching our church services, when we'd post them on Sermon Audio, um, I you know, heard a little bit about live streaming. And I prayed about it and thought about it, and I asked the church that if they wanted to do it, and I, you know, we made some promises that we wouldn't try to change who we were or try to put on some show because the cameras were on. And um, so anyway, uh, we started that, I think, in 2011. And um, you just never know what's going to happen. But when God moves, you just be faithful and be obedient and God will bless that. So by the time COVID hits and they're shutting all the churches down, we shut ours down. Uh, <laughs> A lot of it because I ended up with COVID, was sick three weeks. Uh, so we had like, I don't know, two or three Sundays where nobody was here. And then uh, when I started feeling better, uh, it was just me and I think John and Melissa. And um, so we had already been streaming. So we didn't have to play catch up with that. We, we already had everything in place and we just kept doing what we were doing. And uh, God blessed us through all that. So... Uh, we lost a good man because of that, and uh, I was missing him this weekend. I really was. And uh, Brother Wayne, man, I can't wait to see him in heaven. I love that man. I really did. All right, Revelation chapter 10. Uh, we are clothed with a cloud this morning. And um, I, we started on this, uh, I don't remember, last Sunday, Sunday before that. But let me just, I'm not going to run and teach all these other verses again, but I'm going to get to where I'm going with this and then we'll move on. Uh, my premise is, again, you are at liberty to just believe the Bible, okay? Uh, but I am uh, pulling out of these verses that the only one who qualifies to be described in this manner is the Lord Jesus Christ. It just, it looks right to me. Again, you know, I've been wrong before. I'll be wrong again. And if I knew what I was wrong about, I wouldn't be wrong about it anymore. I'd change it because I don't like being wrong. And uh, I pray about that a lot. God, I don't want to lie to people. So I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven. Seems like it's Jesus. Clothed with a cloud. That is the, that's one of the first big clues is he's clothed with a cloud. And um, that's where we got into Matthew 24, Son of Man coming in the clouds, Matthew 26, and the Son of Man is coming in the clouds of heaven. Acts chapter 1, a cloud received him out of their sight, and the angel said, this same Jesus shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. He went up to heaven in a cloud, he's coming back in a cloud. Revelation 1, 7, behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Revelation 14, and this is where we uh, left off last Sunday. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And upon the cloud, one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And so we went from there uh, last week to like Matthew 13 and, and Mark chapter 4, the parable of the seed and the sower, the parable of the wheat and the tares, all of them deal with harvest time. There you guys are. I was afraid you had the flu. I was afraid you flew. All right, because it's going around. All right, but uh, anyway, both of those, both of those deal with uh, harvest time. And harvest is always a change. It's a transformation. Uh, even, even in, um, I think it's Matthew 13, where he talks about uh, leaven, the kingdom of, uh, kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is likened to uh, a woman who hid, three, uh, hid leaven in three measures of, of uh, wheat or something like that. I want to get it right. I don't want to get it wrong because it means something. And I think I understand what it means. Uh, the, the leaven in the Bible is generally a sign of or a type of sin or false doctrine. Um, 
We have the grain of mustard seed in verse 31. Yeah, verse 33, another parable spoke unto them, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which, and leaven is either like sin or false doctrine, and a little leaven, just takes a little bit, um, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Now think about that. The three measures, anytime you see the number three, you're either going to deal with the Godhead or you're going to deal with sin, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And in this case, I believe it's sin. And um, she hides this leaven, this false doctrine or this sin in three measures of meal. And she waits until the lump is ready. And Lisa's got into baking bread now. Uh, Dad baked bread uh, when we were young. Oh, I loved it. I loved home baked bread. And uh, hang on a second. And Dad always knew when he looked at those pans, when that bread was ready to put in the oven. He just knew, I, I don't know how he knew, he just knew when the leaven was come to the full. And people ask me all the time, Pastor Mike, how, how much more sin do you think is going to be on this earth before God does something about it? I said, it'll come to full. The leaven will leaven the lump. And when the whole lump is ready, God's going to put it in the oven. And he's not going to do it a minute before or a minute too late. He's going to do it right on time. Yes, sir. Well, then I, I said it good, didn't I? Yeah. Right. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. See, it starts out slow at first, but it grows geometrically. And... Um, you know, what, what yeast does is that the, the, little, the little pores or the little pods of yeast, it's got a protective covering that keeps it. You can keep yeast for hundreds of years. And, but once it gets that little bit of moisture on it, that outer core, that outer shell breaks down and there is that, that yeast spore inside of there. And what it does in order to reproduce itself and to do what it does in order to live, it eats the sugar out of the meal that you put in flour, whether it's cornmeal or wheat flour or any barley flour, or any kind of flour. It eats the sugar out of that and then it releases alcohol. What do they put in beer? Yeast. What do they put in uh, wine? What do they put in uh, alcohol? They put yeast in there to eat the sugar out and the yeast releases alcohol. That's why old bread smells like beer. Okay. It's because you use yeast in there. So anyway, to, to me, it's a, it, it's a picture of sin coming to the full. So anyway, back to the clouds. I said, I wasn't going to do this. There, there, there's the rabbit goes. And so I got to chase the rabbit. All right. Now, Joel chapter 2. Turn there. Follow along with me. Joel chapter 2. We're going to look at a day that's coming. Um, there is a lot mentioned in the Bible about a certain day. That certain day, I think, um, is fulfilled both in a 24-hour day and fulfilled also in a thousand year day. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years. That's in Second Peter and it's also in the Psalms. It's two witnesses. And uh, so anyway, um, the day of the Lord and I think the day of uh, the evil day mentioned in Ephesians uh, chapter 6. The evil day is coming. And um, so you have the day of the Lord, you have the evil day. The day of the Lord's wrath, uh, those are just things that you can type in the pure Bible search software or um, I found in an old used bookstore, an old Strong's Concordance. And uh, if you're not very good with a computer, but you want to be able to search the Bible, get a Strong's Concordance because it has this guy, this scholar wrote down every single word that was in the King James Bible and and. Put the verses that it was in there and gives you a list of how many times it's in the Bible. And we have software that does that quicker, but it's still the same, still the same result. 
And so you can study things like the day of the Lord, uh, the day of the Lord's coming, the day of the Lord Jesus, the day of God, the day of Christ, uh, the evil day, so on and so on. Uh, here in Joel 2, it's the day of the Lord. And he says, blow ye the trumpet in Zion. So we have a trumpet that sort of goes along with uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 15. It also goes along with uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So we have the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord. There it is. There's that phrase. The day of the Lord cometh. And that day, and that, that day is nigh at hand. Now, we don't know how soon it's going to be and how God measures how soon. But I promise you, I think God's people know how to look at a lump and say, I think we're close. Amen. We'd have to if we know the Bible and we know sin and we know uh, how it affects people and what it does. And if we look around honestly at our own culture here in America, we are a very sinful nation. No wonder the whole sodomite crowd, the whole, uh, oh, I watched a stupid video this morning. I had to repent. Come up in my YouTube feed and it was this girl. She's probably about 20 years old. She's complaining to the world now that she went to uh, the physical therapy place to have physical therapy done and she said the therapist that I had never did get my pronouns right and I told him I am them they or those or whatever and she, she said he never did get that right and then she said then I got gender dysphoric because he made me do an exercise that made my head go down and touch my chest. And of course, she's a woman, right? She doesn't want to be reminded that she has female features. And so she blamed the therapist. That's America for you. It is. That's what, that's what see, the, the sin of sodomy is not the cause. It's the effect. When you read Ezekiel uh, 16, God said, you're like your sister Sodom. And he said the sin of Sodom was pride, uh, an abundance of idleness, and the fullness of bread. That's America. And he said, that's what brings on the sin. And sin left unchecked and untempered. Eventually, you become Sodom. And God has to destroy Sodom. Yeah, he was vexed with it. And, uh, you know, you, he's, the Bible in Genesis 13 mentions that he pitched his tent towards Sodom. But it, it sort of leaves the idea that he didn't move into Sodom. Well, when the two angels catch up with him, where is he? Right inside the gate, right inside Sodom. And uh, I guess he didn't want to walk to sell his cattle and to sell his, you know, his garden or whatever it was. He didn't. He chose that because of the markets, I guess. And he decided he didn't want to have to walk anymore, so he moved inside the, get the gates of Sodom and had to be rescued out. But anyway, back to the scripture. Day of darkness and of gloominess. It's a, the day of the Lord is a day of clouds and of thick darkness. And there's a reason why it's like this, and we're going to see it in a little bit. But this is not the only place in the Bible that you find that a day, the day of the Lord is a day of clouds. And I want you to remember that, because when... And I'm going to quote it almost verbatim from another place in the Bible. And we'll see if you can identify where it's coming from. When God brings the cloud over the land, there's something in that cloud to be seen that God puts there. Okay? So when he has the day of the Lord and the day of clouds and thick darkness is there, there's a promise that God has given. As the morning spread upon the mountains, and he describes now the clouds. It's a great people and a strong, meaning a strong people. There has not been ever the like. In other words, this invasion has never taken place ever before on the earth like this. It's something 
that no one can prepare for because no one really understands what's coming. You know, a lot of, a lot of the codes and building codes and we have fire inspection every year and, and they tell us, you know, they update us on what the new fire codes are and we have to try to come in compliance with that. And a lot of those are based upon houses or buildings that have burnt down or, or things that have happened and you learn that this is a possibility. So, you know, let's, let's do away with this. We used to have a, a, a fire um, guy from the Festus Fire Department come over when he did his inspection. And uh, Rose would tell you he had a habit. He would go around and pick up all those little brown extension cords. You know, they're about this long and they're real thin. They're brown. They got several places to plug in stuff. And he said, this is not really an extension cord. He said, it's a, uh, it's a fuse for a, for a bomb. And he, he didn't do this with us, but I was told that he would go in other places. And if he found them, he'd cut them up. So they couldn't use them again. He never did that with us. He just handed them to me and he said, I don't want to see these next year. Okay, so as soon as he leave, I give him back to Rose. I said, whatever, I don't care. <laughs> but anyway, I guess he knows what starts a fire, amen? But it's a day of clouds, thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong. There's never been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. So this, there is an army coming that's going to be like a cloud. In Zephaniah chapter 1, it's the great day of the Lord is near. Here we have... Blow you the trumpet in Zion, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Both of them are saying almost the same thing. Joel said it's nigh at hand. Zephaniah said the day is near, but it's the day of the Lord. It is near and hasteth greatly. That means it's speeding up, just like the leaven. Just like the leaven in the bread, when it gets to a certain point, it really starts to rise fast, okay? Uh, and the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress. I mean, think about it. God is finally going to deal with the sin of this world. And not just in our country, everywhere around the world. And there is not going to be anybody that escapes God's justice. It's a day of clouds. Uh, well, let me go back. Verse 15, that day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. That's a list here. Let me count that. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Nine, nine things. Nine is the number for fruit bearing. A woman carries a baby for nine months. Uh, Sarah was 90 when Isaac was born. And uh, there are nine fruits of the Spirit in the ninth book of the New Testament, in the book of Galatians. So anyway, uh, nine is the number for fruit bearing. That sort of, to me, goes into the whole harvest thing where the Son of Man is on the cloud. He's going to take his sickle and harvest the earth. But then he said in verse 16, uh, what Joel said, it's a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. So the trumpet is the word of God. When John heard the voice behind him on the Lord's day, he said it was the, sounded like a trumpet. And he turned and he saw Jesus standing there. So in Ezekiel 33, the responsibility of a watchman, my responsibility is to, and I told some people yesterday, because um, I mentioned some names of some well-known people who do not follow the Bible. And Joel Osteen was one of them, and Joyce Myers was one, and all of that garbage. And I told those people, look, I love you, but I'm not, God didn't call me to make friends. He called me to tell the truth. I had to deal with that issue years ago. And uh, I'm going to speak the truth. If you love the truth, then you'll love me. But if you don't love the truth, you won't like me. And it just so happened that the second talk I did yesterday was on Roman Catholicism. And I asked, is anybody here Roman Catholic? I'm expecting no hands. A lady raised her hand. And I said, who used to be former Catholics? And there were several there. 
Well, I pointed out not just the fallacy of the Catholic Mass and what's wrong with it, biblically, but I dealt with the issue of these pedophile priests and all that. And, I, and so the lady came back to me and, and I thought for a moment that maybe I had broke through something in, in her mind. She came back and she asked me, did I, did I think that it was uh, worse back in days gone past than it is now? And I said, ma'am, I don't. I think it's worse now than it, is, than it was years ago. I said, nothing has changed. The Vatican is, is consistently standing in opposition to priests being married. And that is the key to this. Uh, God said it is not good that the man should be alone. Uh, the qualification for a bishop is that he is to be the husband of one wife. But the Catholic Church has, has removed this from all these priests some, I believe, who really do want to serve God. But they, they can't because they were told by their church that once they become a priest, God would supernaturally endow them with not ever having to want a mate. And it doesn't happen that way. And so these men who have absolutely no legal or moral outlet for the urges that God built into their body, they then must act upon those in an immoral or an illegal manner. And so I told her, I said, ma'am, I, I absolutely think it's worse. And I said, I'll tell you why. Because number one, they don't let the priest marry. Number two, it's the, the confessional. I said, Catholics are told, even young Catholics, boys, nine and 10 years old, they're told to make a good confession which means that they must tell everything, not just the little dirty word that they said last week. They must tell everything that they thought of last week. And believe it or not, nine and 10 and 11 year old boys think of dirty things. And so that priest is grooming those children inside that confessional. As long as that confessional is around, those priests are gonna use that thing to find their next victim, mark it down. And she didn't like that. So as I was talking, I could read her body language that she was done. She started turning her body away from me, you know, with her head like this. And I kind of kept talking, but I thought, now nah, I better just shut up. She's, she's not going to listen anyway. And I don't think she did. And I'll pray for her. But she don't want to hear it. The, the alarm was sounded. And in Ezekiel 33, my obligation is to blow the trumpet, tell what the Bible says, and then it's your responsibility whether you heed the, heed the sound of the trumpet or you don't. But if I don't blow the trumpet and God's wrath comes the, and the, the sword comes and takes all of those people away, they're going to be held accountable for their sins. I'm going to be held accountable for not warning them. That's going to be on my hands. And uh, I have failed at that already enough times to where I'd rather, I just don't want to fail at it again. But anyway, it's a day of trumpet and alarm against the fence cities, against the high towers. Isaiah 44, verse 22. Look at this. So now, this is one of the reasons, I like it, why the day of the Lord is a day of clouds. Notice what he says in Isaiah 44, 22. I have blotted out as a thick, cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins who's he talking to return unto me for i have redeemed thee who's he talking to here it's always israel isn't it in the old testament especially unless god specifically mentions the gentiles it's this is about israel and it's god said guess what i'm going to do the day of the Lord is going to come. And it's a day of thick clouds and, and thick darkness and clouds. Don't be afraid of that. Because when those clouds come, one of the things that I'm going to do with them is blot out all of your sins. And it's going to cost you absolutely nothing. 
And there, it doesn't, and it doesn't, it's, I'm not going to receive any gifts from you. Because the Bible says that the gift given out of the bosom, um, it corrupts judgment. It's like those, there was uh, in Illinois about 10, 15 years ago, there was uh, two judges and a probation officer. And one of the judges died at a hunting retreat that those three guys attended. I don't know if you remember this or not. One of the judges died and it was a drug overdose. And when they started investigating, they found out that both of those judges were taking drugs from drug dealers, specific drug dealers that came in their court. And whenever those drug dealers got arrested, those judges would intervene and make sure that their, um, their court was in that judge's courtroom so that he could either dismiss the charges or give them some kind of pass or say, hey, I need another... <sighs> A gallon of cocaine. I don't know how you buy coke, okay? They were cooked on coke and all this other stuff. And they were getting it from these drug dealers. And if the drug dealer didn't pay along, they went to prison. So after this one judge died of an overdose, they started looking in. The lawyers came out because they said, we're going to go through every client that we had in their courtroom and we're going to get their case thrown out. Because of the corruption of that. A gift always corrupts the judgment of the person you give it to. When you're trying to buy somebody's friendship, or you're trying to buy somebody's loyalty, or you're trying to buy somebody's, um, I don't know, membership or whatever. When you do that, you're, you're be, you are corrupting what they think of you. They won't come after you. They won't come at you. We... I say we, I had to leave the denomination of my childhood because if I was still in it, I would be seeking their favor. Because I did at a young age. I wanted to be seen. I wanted to be known. I wanted to be successful. I wanted everybody to say, when my Hoggard came to their lips, they would say nice things about me. God had different ideas. And so God let me get hurt by these men that I idolized and I left angry. Now I can say what needs to be said about what's wrong with that denomination and what they're doing wrong. I can say it now because I have liberty to do it. Amen. But anyway, th back to this passage. I'm chasing a lot of rabbits today. Hey, it's rabbit season. I don't know. I blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgression and as a cloud thy sin. So I believe in the day of the Lord comes, when that cloud comes over the land, God's gonna, that's the day that God is going to forgive all the sins of Israel. It's like what Paul said, Beloved, be not ignorant of this mystery, that blindness in part has happened unto uh, Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. When that day comes, God is going to reveal himself to Israel uh, exactly who their Messiah is, and it's Jesus Christ. Ezekiel 38, 9. God said, thou shalt ascend. Now remember, the clouds, I believe, are a, an army. He said in Ezekiel 38, Ezekiel 38 is about Gog, which is a chief prince, meaning it's a principality spirit. It rules over the people of, um, of uh, Meshach and Tubal and, and the other nations. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands, and many people with thee. So the cloud that comes over the world is going to be this army that comes like a cloud. They'll be covering the land. Many people with thee. In verse 16, and thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. He says it again. It shall be in the latter days. So we know. Now, here's what I always want you to think about. Um, let me open up to Ezekiel 38. I'll get you to think about something that maybe you haven't thought of. And maybe it's just me being silly. But we'll see. This is uh, verse 16. Um Let's see, There's, they'll come as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the last days. Um, let's see here. 
Where does it say? Okay, verse 4. Look at verse 4. God says, I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth all thine army, horses and horsemen. How many armies today fight with horses, fight on horseback? Did you, did you fight on horseback? No? You fell off the horse, right? Yeah. Um, we still have, I think, divisions in the military, the, like the 101st Cavalry. You were a cavalryman? No? You're... That's my point. Yeah, it was mechanized horses, right? Yeah. They still name them after that. But how many, how many armies fight on horseback? None. That we know of. How many of them, it says, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, and all of them handling swords. How many armies fight with swords? None that we know of. Um, let's see, those should become like a cloud. That's verse 9. Um, but anyway, if you read this chapter, you'll find out that they're fighting with things that nobody fights with anymore. And God said that this prophecy is a latter-day prophecy. It hasn't happened yet. So either the Bible doesn't mean what it says, or it does mean what it says, and it's a different kind of sword than what we know about. A bayonet? Yeah, it is. Yeah, but... Um, Huh? A lightsaber. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Jedi Chris. All right. <laughs> uh, I don't know that when the guys fought the Gulf War that they even used bayonets then. I don't, I don't think so. So I think that this is a band of, it's an army, not from here is what I'm getting at. And this isn't the only place that mentions this kind of fighting. They're going to come with swords and shields and bucklers and spears. All the things that we don't use anymore. Uh, that's what this army is going to use. And I think it's of a higher realm and higher nature. Okay. Do what? Yeah. The people on the border coming in. Um, now. Let's have some fun before they ring the bell. Turn to Job 38. Turn to Job 38. And I'm going to show you something. This to me, when I saw this, I started crying. Job 38. I was convinced at the time... God was helping me understand that my Bible was correct. But, you know, you still have doubts every now and then. And in this case, I believed it, but um, I wanted God to kind of put me over the edge. And this is how he did it. I knew that the sign of Christ coming is that he's coming with the clouds. He's coming in the clouds. He's coming with the clouds. He's clothed with the cloud. The cloud, the cloud, the cloud, the cloud. Everything is about the cloud. And I had believed that his first coming would be a sign ah, of his second coming. So I was reading in Luke and it says it twice in there. She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Laid him in a manger. When the angels appeared to the shepherds, they said, this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Now, how, uncom how common is it for a newborn baby to be swaddled? That's generally, once you clean the baby off, that's the first thing you do is swaddle it. You wrap it up in a tight bundle, almost like corn on a cob. Okay? It's, it's covered. It's wrapped up. Okay? And uh, that's what she did with Jesus. So how is this some big sign of his coming? What Mary was doing was fulfilling the prophecy of him coming in the clouds. In Job 38, 9, 
God is saying to Job, where were you when I did this? Where were you when I made the foundation to the earth? And he says in verse 9, when I made the cloud, the garment thereof, and thick darkness, a swaddling band for it. The swaddling clothes that Mary wrapped Jesus in was a symbol, according to Job 38, 9, of the clouds that he's coming in. He came in the clouds. When he came the first time, we know that the, the night was clear. The shepherds were feeding their flocks by night. Okay? And then the angels appeared. We don't have any mention of there being clouds when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. But we sure have a double witness of the fact that he was wrapped in swaddling clothes. And what does that mean? It means it was the, the garment that he wore was the swaddling band of the earth, the clouds. Okay? And I got more and we'll read Exodus 16. That's your homework next week. And don't do what I did. For Greek class, did my homework in the classroom before the professor showed up. <laughs> Made a B minus in Greek. It got me through. Father, we love you and we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, God, for time spent in your word. Lord, it's never in vain. I pray, dear Father, Lord, that uh, we have learned something. We've taken something, Lord, in. And we, uh, Lord, just put it in our heart. We store it there, Lord, for a day when one of these days something's going to make sense to us. Because we say we read it in the word of God. And I pray, Lord, that you would do that today for us. Bless and honor your word. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And amen.